Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're going to be talking about Wolf Hart Panningberg, one of the great theologians of the late 20th century. And uh, that's stimulation. And so we're going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Father God, we come before you today and we ask for your forgiveness and cleansing. And Father, as we think and talk about Panningberg's uh, ideas, we pray that you bless us and encourage us and help us to stay faithful to your word and to grow in the knowledge of you. Bless this video and may it be a blessing and an encouragement to people. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, um, we're going to be looking at Pannenberg's systematic theology and his ideas. We're not going to cover all things or anything um, of a wide spectrum, but just home in on one or two aspects of his theology. I have to say that we're coming at this from an evangelical point of view. That is, uh, I believe, the inspiration of the Bible. I believe in Orthodox Christianity. And uh, so I don't endorse some of the ideas of Pannenberg. It falls far short of Orthodox Christianity. However, I do think it's important that we don't be anti-intellectual, that we read other theologians and see what they have to say and try to think through biblically maybe what they've said and uh, so that's what we're going to do uh, I think it's important that sometimes we read books that challenge us even though we do not agree with them but also there is many things in Panningberg that will encourage your faith as well as many things that you will disagree with if you are a Bible believing Christian so I want you to know and I want you to understand that I am not endorsing the theology of Wolf Hart Pannenberg. If you wanted a systematic theology that I would endorse and for you to uh, accept as a Bible teacher for your own Christian life, it would be John Calvin's Institutes. Um, that would be something I would endorse. So I'm not endorsing Wolf. What I'm doing is reading some of the work that he's done and just thinking about it and encouraging you to think through whatever he's saying about. That's all I'm doing. Okay. Okay. In an Introduction to Systematic Theology, page 5, Panningberg says, If we suppose that God of Israel and of Jesus is the one and only true God, then only then is there sufficient reason for believing in that God, even if one is not a Jew. I think what Panningberg is trying to do here is root Christianity in the history of Judaism and to show that God worked in a particular nation and if we don't believe in a God who did that then we're not really accessing the real God I think there's a point there that the history of the Jews is important as a, as a polemic in the defense of the Christian faith and an understanding of the Christian faith because God worked in, in there is where we can see the revelation of himself Page 5, Pannenberg, the Christian faith cannot live by relenting to the history of Jesus as to a myth of Christian ancestors if it were just that. He goes on, the story of Jesus Christ has to be history not in all its beliefs but in its core if the Christian faith is to continue. Um, I don't agree fully with Pannenberg here but I agree in a lot of cases here because I think he's right to spot that Christianity is based in history and I think that's what sets Pannenberg apart from a lot of other theologians in the, in the academia because Pannenberg lays a great deal of stress that the Christian faith is rooted in history. There's a famous letter where he had a and Karl Barth said to him that you can't have a belief in Christianity rooted in history. It's not possible to find the historical Christ and Pannenberg said that that it is and so they had a, a debate about that and disagreed. But I think Pannenberg is right. If you are a theologian or a pastor, if you don't believe that Jesus was real history then you're going to have problems. You're not going to be preaching the true Christ. But also here he says not in all its details, meaning that you know we're not going to be able to verify all the historical data about Jesus. Um, so I take his point there. 
But um, I think that um, from a Christian point of view, uh, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. It's important to to we might not be able to prove every minor historical detail, but we have enough detail proven to us as historically reliable about the New Testament that that it gives us place to have confidence in the message of Christianity. He writes, uh, Intro to Systematic Theology, Chapter 2, Problem of Christian Doctrine. He writes, The reality of God is crucial if one is serious in talking about specific calling of the church as well as a special task assigned to theology, page 20 21. Again, I, I agree here with Pannenberg. I think that if we're doing theology, we, we have to have a, a belief in the doctrine of God. And I think a lot of theology over the last 100 years has tended to make God in the cultural image. But we have to engage with the real God. We have to see the reality of who he is. If we don't do that, if we don't, if we, if we don't do that, then we're failing as theologians, we're failing as pastors. We're, we're there to tell people about the gospel so that people can meet the reality of God. And the church is to think theologically, and I agree with that with Pannenberg. Page 22 of his book. Within the setting of a secularist culture, it is even more important that in religiously informed culture to urge the ultimate reality of God upon the hearts and minds of the people. And there are no other ages to do it than the preacher and the theologian. I really like his style here. He, he reminds me of Barth, Karl Barth, uh, who in his dogmatics, Gottingen dogmatics, uh, says something similar. But I, what I find heartening there is in the encroachment of the secularism, he's saying we need to proclaim who God is in his greatness. And the persons who were able to do that are the preachers and the theologians. The preachers because they can expound the word, the theologians because they can systemize the word or pass on the word. Page 29, therefore the God of He says, therefore the God of Whitehead is not the biblical creator God. Furthermore, the Whiteheadian God is one and to nine. Here he's taking a shot at Whitehead and other liberal Christians who came up with an idea of God based on psychology. Chapter 3 is the doctrine of creation in an age of scientific cosmology. In this part, he doesn't use any biblical pieces to make up his theology. I think that's disturbing. If you're going to do a theology, you need to be biblical. Chapter 4, he talks about systematic theology within a framework. He says, page 55, Why should one become a Christian if Jesus were not the one saviour of the world? Uh, I think that's a bit of a silly question to ask. I think that um, you can't be a Christian unless you believe in Jesus as the Saviour. Page 66, from the point of view, says Pannenberg, of such a broader approach to the concept of the Son of God as eternal correlate of the Father, his incarnation and the event of the advent of second Adam coincide because the incarnation of the Son is now seen as the completion of the creation of humanity in the image of God, page 66. It, it's, this sounds very much like Irenaeus's recapitulation uh, and I think there is truth in that. I do think that 
there is truth in that Christ came down and took himself human nature as and it's a way of reconciling human beings to God page 67 Pannenberg the present model the kenotic movement of the Son is becoming incarnate is understood as already characteristic of his eternal relation to the Father rather than involve renunciation of his divine entity page 67 I would agree with uh, to him uh, to a part in there. I don't agree with the um, kind of canonic uh, views of Christ. I don't think his attributes of divinity were dis were were got rid of uh, in his incarnation, uh, and I think that's what Pannenberg is saying. Page sixty-eight. Our scheme, however, the transition from the Trinitarian concept of God to Christology is mediated through his peculiar doctrine of predestination which treats the Son of God as the only chosen but also the only reprobate. Contrasting the present model, the canonic movement of the Son is becoming incarnate, is taken as already characteristic of his eternal relation to the Father rather than involving a renunciation of his divine deity, page 68. To me, I think Bart's double dutch uh, on that, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think you can be too clever for your own good. I think that um, Christ um, is God and he's man. Just read that quote again. Bar scheme, however, the transition from Trinitarian concept of God to Christianity is mediated through his peculiar doctrine of predestination which treats the Son of God as the only chosen but also the only reprobate and abandoned one I don't agree with that at all I don't I don't particularly think his interpretation of Karl Barth his predestination does play a big role in his theology but uh, Karl Barth says a lot why he uses the Christological method I think you've got to be careful sometimes with these academic theologies. They do waffle sometimes. Okay, uh, Systematic Theology, Volume 1, Wolfhart Panningberg. Page 59. Dogmatic, uh, dogmatics as a presentation, Christian doctrine then has to be a systematic theology, namely a systematically presented by the relation of all individual themes to the reality of God. Page 59. I do agree with him that there is a need for dogmatics and systematic theology. Uh, I think systematic theology helps you to get an understanding of history, understanding of what the scriptures are saying. Um, and it can be really helpful. Page 94 in volume 1, he says, There can be no strict proof because the existence of God would have to be proved not only to us, but above all to the reality of the world. Page 94. There can be no strict proof because the existence of God would have to be proved not only to to us, but above all to the reality of the world. Um, I don't agree with that. I think Christianity can be proved, but it's proved on a multi-level perspective. Um, and nature is a reflection of God. So nature can give us a knowledge of God if we study it. It is important to note, says Pannenberg, that myth is not eliminated in Christianity but integrated and transcended, page 187. I think that's very difficult, nuanced kind of language. Um, the resurrection, it, it depends what you define by myth. The word myth has many different meanings. In the scholarship of uh, religions, ancient religions, the word myth has many, many understandings. It's not as easy to use the word myth as Pannenberg has. 
Uh, he says it is important to know that myth is not eliminated in Christianity but integrated and transcended. It's an interesting thought. It's kind of like what um, C.S. Lewis said that Christianity is the ultimate myths of all myths that all the myths have kind of dovetailed into Christ. Not that um, C.S. Lewis believed that Christianity was a myth but he's just saying the stories of the myths kind of hint to that there must be one final story that encapsulates them all. I wouldn't say there's any myth in Christianity at all, I think it's historically well based. He writes, all the revelation of God in its historical action moves towards the still outstanding future of the consummation of history. It's claimed to reveal the one God who is the world's creator, reconciler and redeemer is open to future verification in history which is yet incomplete and which is still exposed therefore to the question of its truth. And, um, very interesting thought. I think that uh, I, like, I like the historical grounding of his argument and his thinking as the revelation of God in his historical action moves toward the still outstanding future of the consummation. I like this revelation in history and I like the interplay of the future and the present. He says verification, verification which is incomplete, I think that's just mere semantics. The verification is complete in the sense of the totality of what Christianity is, i.e. the death and resurrection of Christ rooted in the Bible. Page 299, he says to find a basis for the doctrine of the Trinity we must begin with the way in which Father, Son and Spirit come on the scene and relate to one another in the event of revelation. I totally agree. I think if we study the doctrine of the Trinity in its historical framework within the New Testament that is the best way. Here lies the material justification for the that the doctrine of the Trinity must be based on the biblical witness of revelation or on the economy of salvation. Page 299. I agree. Uh, very, very good. More thoughts on volume 1. Page 334. We can no longer adopt today these traditional ways of losing espousing, I think, the trinity of persons on the unity of the Father or the Divine Essence because they entail either subordination or subalienism. Um, I don't know, I think that uh, some ancient theologians had a kind of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, in the ancient creeds there is a sense of of um, some kind of subordination but yet they un united they are one so I'm not so sure if it's fully true in the creeds that what he's saying um, the scriptures clearly teach the Father Son and Holy Spirit and they are one but there is a relationship the Father the Son Father plan salvation the Son accomplish salvation the Holy Spirit reveals the different roles so I, I think, it, I don't know, I, I think that St. Augustine's book on the Trinity might be a good place to start and Torrance on the Trinity. And also Stuart Olliot has written a book on the Trinity. Have a look at that. Page 396. May one say then that the biblical idea of the divine spirit implies the thought of God as infinite so that even if the infinite is not the essential concept of God from which all the qualities of his essence are to be derived it is still to be viewed as the initial concept of the divine essence to which all other statements about God's qualities relate 
as concrete expressions of the divine nature. Page 396. I'm not so much sure agree with that. Uh, to home in on one attribute and say that's the central foci of God, I, I think is a dangerous thing. I think we should think of all the attributes of God as significant and important and central. Uh, Systematic Theology, Volume 2, he writes, In the person, then, the integration of the individual moment's life results in identity of authentic selfhood. Page 276. The more important point of all this juncture is one we touched on above, namely that death is an essential consequence of sin rather than a punishment that God has arbitrarily set and imposed. I think that's a little bit of a statement. The more important point at this juncture is one, is one we touched on above, namely that death is an essential consequence of sin rather than the punishment that God has arbitrarily set. No, I think it's quite clear that death is a punishment for sin that Adam and Eve did. Uh, he writes on Christology, Christology from below faces the same problem. It is and must have similar preconceptions in describing the message of history of Jesus. In particular, it exposes to the layer of using a general anthropology that is conceived in terms of the God of revelation in Christ as the basis of its interpretation of the coming and the special history of Jesus, page 290. Um, so he's basically using anthropology, theology of an historical Christ and who God is. He notes, the language of the resurrection of Jesus is that of metaphor. The idea of raising from the dead and eternal life as its roots in Jewish eschatological, or eschatological expectation of resurrection from the dead provided linguistic, linguistic expression and a conceptual formula for the Christian Eastern message. I would agree to, in certain part, that the Jewish context provides the basis for an understanding of the resurrection. So, so that's Panenberg. And uh, we could go on. I think the main thing to remember about Panenberg really is his whole theology is really trying to root the Christian faith in history. What is the Christian faith teaching? Um, that's where he's coming from. And I think that's refreshing. Uh, it, uh, and it was refreshing in its when it first came out because there was a lot of attack on the Christian faith and whether it was historical for so for Panningberg to come out and say that Christianity can be judged uh, from a historical perspective and we can develop a theology from that was a radical thing and and really challenged uh, the academic world in theology um, like I said, I don't agree with some of the comments he made, um, but I do think that um, his books are very helpful in uh, this historical emphasis on the Christian faith. Some of the theology is a bit dodgy, uh, it doesn't come up to scratch, but he's a heavy hitter and you can't really engage in theology 
unless you have at least read something of Pannenberg. So I'd encourage you to read him. And uh, may God bless you. And uh, like I said, uh, you get a stimulated in reading him. I'm not saying that I agree with you, but be challenged and certainly have a lot to think about, whatever your theological position or belief. Thank you for listening and God bless you.